I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the founder of the church I served as a bishop. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many others have made a similar journey into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about, people who want to share their story. So if you're a Latter-day Saint seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I again appreciate you joining us. And I hope you've enjoyed these last couple of presentations with Warren Puckett. We're going to finish up a third one here today. We just had these lists of topics. So we weren't sure exactly the timing and everything, how it had yeah. come out, but we just found it so fascinating. I hope you have too, and I hope those that are listening, we love the Mormon people. Absolutely. We have family in oh, Mormon. Absolutely. I have family. Uh, but Mormonism, I mean, once we started seeing things, it dominoed out. It just was so, uh, it just seemed, became obvious that there were problems. And, and I hope that you picked up on some of those things. And if you're willing to investigate just a little bit more, there's uh, several websites that you can go to, utlm.org, mrm.org, mormonthink.org. Uh, Org, I believe, IRR. Yeah, MormonThink.com, IRR.org, and the CES letter. I don't know if you are aware of that, but just type in CES letter, and it has a presentation of different topics that uh, a, a CES person was asked to answer and he never did. But they highlight these different things that people are finding out. The church doesn't want you to to study. They've yeah. kind of hidden these gospel topics. We'll talk about them later. I was just in the middle of talking about Boyd K. Packer and his comment about telling the whole truth. And you were mentioning the, the sin of omission. I mean, yeah. that that's yeah. the thing. And, and he says, uh, Boyd K. Packer, just to repeat, some things that are true aren't very useful, he says. Mm -hmm. Some think that they need to be totally honest and tell everything, and tell everything, and they don't, he says. One other thing he said when he was being interviewed, or someone was being interviewed as a prospective member of BYU faculty in 1976, Elder Packer said this to him, I have, I have a hard time with historians because they idolize the truth. The wow. truth is not uplifting, it destroys. Historians should tell only that part of the truth that is inspiring and uplifting. Now, when my wife asks me how she looks in the morning, then I'm, w I'm willing to, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm willing to say what she wants to hear. But I think when an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. is, is talking, he needs to be, tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yeah. So help, so help me. Well, what's interesting to me, and one of the things, there's just so many little nails in the coffin, but there's a Living Christ document back in 2000 that was issued by the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve. And in that, and it just struck me so much back five, six years ago, it says in that d document, it says, we declare in words of solemnity that his priesthood and his church has been restored upon the earth quote, build upon the foundation of dot, 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 apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's Ephesians 2.20. If you look up Ephesians 2.20, you know what the dot, and dot, dot represent? What is that? The word the. <laughs> so it should read, build upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Yes. Right here, the Bible, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's wow. a sin of omission, in my opinion. Yeah. And then the last one I'll indicate is back, I don't know if it was the end of 15, 2015 or 2016, a children's chorus sang or did some kind of an interesting thing with Isaiah 9-6. And also a prophet, and I'm not, I couldn't find it, I kept looking for it, one of the apostles said the same thing in a talk. They quoted Isaiah 9-6 and omitted the word, the everlasting God. Wow. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, dot, 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 the Prince of Peace. Wow. Left out the everlasting Father. I, I just think it's so significant. Anyway, the next one. 
uh, we've got here is missionary work. Missionary work. You Christians have missionaries. Well, yes, absolutely. Yeah, all yeah. throughout the world. I mean, I mean, you can check any kind of uh, statistics on. Now, maybe they don't have a force of what? How many? How many? Seventy-five, eighty. Is it seventy-five, eighty now? now? Uh -huh. Oh my goodness! But uh, yeah, of course, they wouldn't send be surprised if there were that many Christian missionaries out there. I wouldn't though. be surprised Not at all. Not from an individual church, maybe, but yeah. But it's funny, Earl, because these Mormon missionaries are going out. To now, they say to teach the gospel, to preach Christ, preaching Mormonism. They're yeah. trying to bring people into Mormonism, not Christ. I can't tell you how impactful that was for me. Just yeah. 10, 15 years ago, I'm sitting there in a sacrament meeting. I think a young man's giving his report, talking about, you know, got baptized into the church and he had these converts that came to the church. And I'm sitting there thinking, He's not talking about Jesus at all. And then I thought about my own mission. I never preached Jesus. I was baptizing people into the church, That's trying right. to convert them to the church. And our eight-year-olds, we tell them, mm -hmm. oh, you're going to get baptized into the church. Yeah. They're not accepting Jesus and his yeah. sacrifice. And anyway. Absolutely. And, and, and you said something here a while back that, you know, your faith is really in the church. It's really in the it church. Is, you know? and, and I know... They, they'll deny mind. that, but you know, wow, that's not true. My faith is in the Savior. But if you really are honest with yourself, your faith. The family, I mean, the church, the culture, the social. Because the question is, can, is Jesus enough? Is he enough? And, he and you have Mormonism. to answer if you're a Mormon. No, he's not. No, I've got to go to the temple. I've, I've got to keep the commandments. Exactly. I need to do, do, do. Exactly. And you just feel, and, and what the guilt and the and the the pride when you're mm -hmm. when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing you know mm -hmm. how good you feel you've done your home teaching or but then the guilt if you don't do your home teaching exactly. I mean it's just there's just not a relying on Jesus the way and I think every person that I've interviewed and there's like I said over 250 wow um, every one of them has come to realize who Jesus is and they did not know him Praise as a Mormon. God. Yeah. I can speak for myself. I can't speak for anybody else, but I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know him like I know him now. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have the relationship that I have with him now. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I can't speak for anybody because you know God knows the hearts. Right. Yeah. You know, He's the one that judges us and judges the heart. I, I can judge Mormonism, and I will judge Mormonism. Because <laughs> you've uh, been a Mormon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and and anyway. We'll leave that at Well, I think one of the things that I tried to do, or we were trying to do with this, this list of things, we mentioned that Christians have values. They love their family. They do. they do missionary work. We didn't mention this, and it's not part of our thing right now, but being a cheerful giver. You know, Mormons yeah. have tithing. We didn't even list that on here, but, but the Bible says to be a cheerful giver. It doesn't even command tithing. Yeah. Exactly. outside of the Old Testament, but in the New Testament under Jesus and the gospel of grace, it's being a cheerful giver. So I guess what I'm trying to point out here is that Mormons have no respect really for Christians or don't understand that they have values. They do missionary work. They donate tremendously to other people and, and other causes. And, um, you know, there's nothing to be afraid of. No. If you're questioning Mormonism and you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, maybe there is... There is hope in Christ and hope in the, uh, Absolutely. In, the in the in the Christian Absolutely. world. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So apostasy and restoration. Well, there, I don't have a lot on this, except a couple of verses. Okay. It says, "Heaven and earth will pass away." Let me find it. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You know, that sounds fairly convincing to me. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like, you know, the Bible wasn't to be trusted or, you know, how I yeah. was as a Mormon. But those words strike me. Another one that really kind of helped me understand that there had never been an apostasy. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Right. Well, there's been two or three Christians throughout. Absolutely. You know, if not millions more. And, uh, yeah. But and it's that, that priesthood authority thing, you know. That's the that's the key that they uh, why they use the restoration. The, the high priest of Jesus, they don't recognize that exactly uh, that, that it had to be restored. Yeah, but can I just share a little bit Please. with that? Is it, you know, you remember the Mormon teaching of you know John the Beloved, he never 
tasted death, and yeah, yeah. he's probably still yeah. around the earth. The three Nephites. Right. So they had. Did the they priesthood? hold the priesthood? Yeah. I mean, I'm just asking. I mean, it's it's a, you know what? Why did it have to be restored through Joseph Smith if you have people <laughs> here here on the earth that can do it? You know, just something to think yeah. about, friends. Something the same when about. we talked about this, I think, in the first uh, episode that we did this. Um, uh, why would John the Baptist give Joseph Smith a Levitical priesthood yeah. when he's not yeah. from the tribe of Levi? Yeah, and then the last one from Isaiah 48, 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand Praise forever. God. And, you know, I believe, yes, this thing has some warts in it. And I've learned that, that it's not 100% perfect. But it, it contains the gospel of Jesus yes. Christ and the gospel of grace. And it's... Uh, it, it's a guidebook, and it's, it, it does what it needs to do. God has wa watched over it. There's manuscripts. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. I love how you said that, though. It contains, you yeah. know, because, you know, it says John 1, 1, you yeah. know, in the beginning was the Word. You know, it contains God's, you know, the words, you know, the written yeah. Word. We can, tr we can trust what's in here, forever. what God wants us to have. Yeah. We can trust that. So it contains. Either that or God it failed. It contains the Word. And Jesus failed. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's yeah. why we needed a restoration because Jesus and God couldn't do their, yeah. do their thing. They needed Joseph Smith to do it. All right, my friend. Next one is born again. Born what? again. Praise God. I'm thankful to be born again. <laughs> Yeah, so tell us your well, go ahead. Yeah, Second Corinthians, real quick. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I get excited about that because I experienced that. You know, I I became a new creature in Christ. You know, and it's yeah. just a beautiful thing. I didn't need Mormonism to do it. Matter of fact, I didn't get it in Mormonism. I got it outside of it. And it's a wonderful thing. And it was all about just coming to the Lord and saying, you know, God, I'm a sinner and I'm, I need a Savior. I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to come into, I want you to come into my life and change me, Lord. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's so simple, Earl. And it does. And, and I've, I haven't been the same since. Now, do, does everything, is it happily ever after, you know, just, you know, what is that? Roses are blooming. You perfect. Yeah, yeah. Roses yeah. blooming beneath our feet, you know, <laughs> right. is that I love right. at home? Uh, no. Yeah. But I have a relationship. I, my spirit is perfect. I have a perfect spirit who do, desires. And it's, it's this, this uh, fight between that perfect desire through the spirit to live for God and dealing with my flesh. You know, you know? The, the picture that I had was me standing there in front of God, admitting that I'm a sinner and I have yeah. a Savior who's paid for my sins. Praise God. Standing there. And it's not about what I've done, my temple work, ordinances, my tithing, uh, my temple, my Sunday, Sunday attendance or anything. That's it's right. what Jesus did yeah. on the cross. And He's my advocate. He's Amen. my... And for a Mormon to to go into that process thinking that they're going to impress God or that they put him in his debt. I know that Doctrine and Covenants verse that says, when you keep my commandments or something, you are bound. I am bound when bound. you do what I say. Yeah, isn't it crazy? To put God in your debt. Yeah. It's just or not, that you can bind, that God is bound. So yeah. I, that word has always struck me funny. You know, just because when I keep my commandments, and yet Mormons, yeah. did you you experience this? I'm sure, fast and testimony me. I mean, just your life as a Mormon. Yeah. Did anybody ever admit to really being a sinner? I I know we always said the words, "I know I'm not perfect," but it never really. I'm not. I'm a sinner. Yeah. You know, I'm. I'm. I'm always I'm a, a sinner. sinner. I can't not be a sinner. <laughs> I'm human. I'm fleshly. I'm a sinner. But you know, Jesus said, "Be ye perfect." Yeah. He didn't say become. Now, how in the world, Earl, are you going to be perfect by your own volition, by, by yeah. what you do? Yeah. You know, there has to be something supernatural yeah. that took place, and we know that there was. Jesus took place. That's why that Matthew 8, uh, 5, 8 was so impactful. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, who's pure in heart? Somebody that has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus yes, Christ. Exactly. I can't be pure in Through heart. Through faith. Faith. Yeah, my heart is not pure. It That's never right. will be. So that was either a, a promise that Jesus couldn't hold up, or he knew that if you accept him, you'll have everlasting life and yes. you can see God, which means you're going to be saved. Yeah. 
whatever Mormons want to define that as. Yes. In addition to resurrection, you're going to be with God. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, Warren, thank you on that. That was born again. And you know what? Some people don't have that broken moment. I, I didn't. I God really, deals I, with you individually. Yeah, you know what you need. You don't, I didn't need a slap in the face. No. I, did, I didn't leave Mormonism to come to Christ originally. I thought I was good to go with him. Yeah. But I've since learned reading and studying the Bible that that wasn't the case. All right, thank you. So Carthage and the martyrdom. Carthage. Well, <laughs> this is an interesting thing because it's claimed that before Joseph Smith was murdered in the Carthage jail, he stated, I'm going like a lamb to the slaughter. Yeah. yeah. Doctrine and Covenants 135.4. Most Mormons believe that Joseph Smith died without putting up a struggle. I don't know if they all believe that or whatever, but the actual truth is that he died in a gunfight. In the history of the church, the following account is given concerning Joseph Smith's death. Immediately there was a little rustling at the outer door of the jail and a cry of surrender and also a discharge of three or four firearms followed instantly. Joseph sprang to his coat for his six-shooter and Hiram for his single barrel. Hmm. And apparently he shot six times. And uh, Anyway, I, um, the whole thing about the martyrdom, I, I realized he was in jail and the people were attacking. He had he'd ruined the or broken down. He and the council had agreed to destroy the... A Nauvoo Expositor, you know, that paper that was publishing bad stuff about the polygamy. So they were against him. I think there have been a lot of polygamy people in the Nauvoo area probably that were against him. And he was also, he had also given the women the Masonic uh, information, you know, the rites and things that he had added into the Nauvoo Temple, the Masonic kind of stuff. Yeah. And so he had that group against him. So there was no doubt somewhere somebody was going to get him. But, but going to the going like a lamb to the slaughter, yeah. another historical fact is actually him and his brother and some other people had crossed the river. They, yeah. were, he they, were, they were headed out. They were heading out of town. Yeah. And I can't remember, Earl, maybe you know the story, the historical fact. Who was it that... Talked him into coming back. Well, what I understand, the account that I shamed him into coming back. Yeah, kind of shamed him. Yeah, you, you, uh, you need to do this. Yes. And then at the end, and it's interesting, um, John D. Lee, who's written a confession uh, book, claimed that Joseph Smith used the exact words that a mason is supposed to use in the case of distress as he mm. fell out the window. Joseph left the door, sprang through the window, and cried, Oh, Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? And the, the Mormon writer Cecil McGavin admitted that Joseph Smith gave the Masonic signal of distress. Yeah. So, and you know, anyway, that was the thing too dump. is not that to point out all of Joseph Smith's yeah. flaws. It's to to point out the the myth making yeah. here and all these stories that have. Well, that, he that he we went heard. so nobly as a martyr. Yeah. You know, if I had a if I had a pistol and somebody's trying to kill me, yeah, I'm probably yeah, going to use it too. I don't blame him. Yeah, I don't blame him. But this myth making that has taken yeah, place, yeah, and become like, greater it, than the, you the know, story. other than Jesus Christ, the greatest man that ever lived. Yeah. yeah. All right, sir, you've got the Bible, Dead Sea Scrolls, Dead sea and scrolls. manuscripts. Okay. So we can't trust this book, right? I, I, I guess not. You know, but here's the interesting thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls is that, that there's, all in all, it pretty much validates what we already have. Everything, at least in the Old Testament, is yes. validated like 99% exactly. or 95, 80% or whatever, yeah. And not only that, we have, how, how many manuscripts, Greek man? I mean, it's I've like, heard 20,000 or something. Really, that much? The Vatican has wow. some, there's others. I mean, we don't have the original manuscripts, okay? No. We admit that, but the early, not pioneers, the early guys, you know, the prof, uh, people in the, in the early church in the first, second century, they quoted from, the, from the yeah. Paul's book. And this, this was in place, the New Testament was in place long before this Council of Nicaea. I know that's a big thing yeah, that's with Mormons. Thing. They think that that's where it came about and they did this and that change and all that. Yeah. This, this book was, was there and, and in, in place uh, and anyway. the interesting thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls is it doesn't contain any of the JST, the Joseph Smith translations. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is it doesn't true. validate the yeah. Joseph Smith translations. All those changes, you know, he where made. he inserted himself in the gen in, Genesis, in Genesis. You know, it's kind of uh, interesting that isn't way, that isn't funny? it? But anyway, th we could say a lot about that, but now, I guess that's suffice. We've actually covered the topics that we've listed, but there were so many more. Oh, I actually have one last one here. 
if you'll excuse me, um, the essays that have been written. Yeah. There's uh, about uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, about 16 of them. I would, li I would challenge every member to read these things, because, yeah. and, and especially the footnotes. Sometimes the references are good. But it talks about plural marriage, the First Vision accounts, Book of Mormon and DNA, race and the priesthood, pl plural marriage, uh, becoming like God, and mother in heaven. Now, I haven't, I haven't gone there to look at them. I've heard that there's stuff on there. You know, is it easy to navigate through? No, it's tough. Yeah. You, you've got to be looking for gospel purpose? topics. Or gospel. Yeah. <laughs> you can actually go, I think, to utlm.org, and she has, uh, Sandra Tanner has put in there gospel essays, gospel topics. Okay. I think you can hit that and get all these. I did go to lds.org to get these. One of the words that I came, and I, don't, I actually did a search on it, and I, I thought one, one of the general authorities said something. But underneath, underlying all this, I believe this is an inoculation process. Yeah. I believe us old guys, in other words, are going to pass on. Oh, yeah. And we're, we're going to leave the church if we do. I mean, I guess we have some of the money and the tithing, whatever. But the young people need to be inoculated. They can't be, sh they can't be shocked by this stuff. Yeah. The church is going to be able to say with this out there, look, we've always talked about this. It's always been there. Here's our answers for it, whether it's the full truth or not. But they're inoculating the youth and the young people against, yeah. against uh, these questionable things. I have a theory too, Earl, about Mormonism is, you know, there's always going to be Mormons. And yeah. I'll tell you why. Uh, because two, th two quotes I've heard by Mormons. One was a branch president. He said, I've always looked at it like this. If the church isn't true, it ought to be. Uh, yeah, and then that. the other one I heard before, which is just crazy, uh, the church is true even if it isn't. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Now, there's always going to be that group because there's a core. The truth yeah. or the defined truth, the truth that they want yeah. to be, is more well, important. I so. believe that their knowledge is so shallow that they really don't have a depth. And when we present stuff like this, it gets dismissed pretty quickly yeah. because they don't really want to know. Well, I, there's a whole list of things here, and we're going to cover them real quick. Okay. Um, you mentioned the JST. Yeah. That's one thing we didn't talk about, but uh, certainly interesting. The Kinderhook plates. Yes. Where Joseph was tricked into believing that these plates were original kinds of stuff, turned out to be a hoax. Mountain Meadow Massacre, we didn't talk about. The blacks and the priesthood. Yeah. You know, that, that, that the church would hold against the blacks or people of color. Yeah. I mean, that's no, not God-like at all, no. and yet they did that. One thing that's been interesting to me, too, is that Joseph Smith restored the one and only true church, and here we have probably 150 to 200 different splinter groups that have yeah. come off of the yeah. only true church. You know, exactly. And the polygamists well, are more more in line with Joseph Smith's church than the mainstream church. You've got groups now that, that are coming out that they believe in Mormonism is yeah. the truth. They believe in Joseph Smith. They just think that guys up in Salt Lake at headquarters have got it all wrong. Yeah, you yeah know, there's, there's all a kinds few of, of stuff going on like that. We didn't talk about Book of Mormon DNA and archaeology at all. Right. And I mentioned to you earlier a lot of that. that actually, you know, the Vikings are presumed to have come around 1000 A.D. or so. There's more evidence that the Vikings were in North America for wow. just a few seasons or whatever they were at than there were for the Nephites and Lamanites for a thousand years. Yeah. No chariots, no swords, all that stuff in the Book of Mormon. There's just nothing. So what do you make out of these seminars that you, like, what is his name, Ron Meldrum? I don't know how they do it. You know? There's no, it's not total, totally honest. It yeah. can't be. And uh, I don't know, eventually, you know, the Book of Abraham, they've kind of said it's now a translation, an inspired translation. They really didn't need the papyrus, even though Joseph said he was translating it. I can. See I guess the they didn't need the gold plates either. I can see, well, he didn't. That's one thing we didn't talk about, seer stone and the head and the hat. Yeah. We didn't talk about that. Yeah. But I'm thinking that eventually maybe the Book of Mormon becomes a, an inspired translation. Mm. So Joseph didn't need the, the plates. And it's just a good story um, that's, wow. you know, I don't know what will happen. Changes in the temple ceremony in 1990. Did I've, you go before that? I've experienced, then? yeah. Did I've you go before that. 1990? I did. 
so you know about the Masonic kinds Absolutely. of things. Absolutely. Did you ever realize that you were wearing Masonic symbols on your on your uh, garments? Yeah. So I, I can't recall if I even gave it much thought. You know, I was yeah. young. And we I was, talked about that uh, fig leaf that we wear. Yeah. And then the, uh, I mentioned already the Journal of Discourses, Miracle of Forgiveness, Mormon Doctrine, and other thing where other prophets and apostles, we've just kind of thrown them off to the side because we don't like what they said or something. But one other thing I thought was interesting is how, how do you relate to this question about uh, the church not being a, a hospital for sinners. <laughs> well, how do I relate to it? Well, what did you think about it? Did you sense that too, that you had to be pretty perfect to be a, an accepted member of the church? There again, I'm going to speak for myself. Yeah. It made me sicker in a, in a spiritual sense. Now, that doesn't apply to everybody. As a Mormon or as a Mormon. As a Mormon. Yeah, I was sicker. Uh, the religion itself did not give me the hope that I have in Christ. It did not give me the faith that I have in Christ. It actually was detrimental to me. Now, I know many Mormons can't relate to that, but for me on a personal level, because I go back to what Gordon B. Hinckley said, it is either the truth, Earl. Yeah. It is either the truth or it's a, a fraud. It's, a fraud. it's either the kingdom of God, it's God's church, or, and this is not my words, it's yeah. Gordon B. Hinckley's word, or it's nothing. Now, I agree with that. Yeah. And, and, and those, that has an impact, whether you want to admit it or not. We, we know what the truth is, Earl. Yeah. We know what the truth is. Well, we've actually run out of time wow. again. Isn't that that's amazing? A, that's crazy. Let me just kind of with, with your, but our hope and prayer is that you will come to trust the Bible, study the Bible, Absolutely. realize what the foundation is and uh, what God's given us and what Jesus has done for us. Jesus we, is enough. That we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus is enough. Yeah. Jesus plus nothing, <laughs> having that faith. And, and then show your love to man and God and, uh, and you'll have, have everlasting life. Amen. That's our promise. That's wonderful, isn't it? So, yeah, it it's is. So, anyway, I, uh, one of the things that I felt that, that really has been good for me is, is not judging others. Yeah. You know, I used to judge people oh, if they yeah. smelled a little bit, if they didn't look, they had tattoos. Yeah. You know, what if they wore a blue shirt no, to church? Yeah, instead of a white <laughs> I had a stake president tell me, you've got to get your elders quorum guy to wear a white shirt instead of the blue shirt. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us. I hope that you found this interesting and yeah. we will do it again. Thanks. Mm -hmm.